When we began, we thought if we get three or four shows out of this, that's great. I don't think either of us felt that it had any legs at all. To imagine that we would keep going for 35 years was completely unimaginable. The great thing about sport, though, is it forces you to live in the present. So this is the thing that has enabled John and me to keep going for all this time. I, I, I suppose we've done it long enough now to make it look easy, but um, maybe it's not. Both of us, I think, are outsiders, but in a completely different sort of way. Completely different in the sense of how we would spend time and pass time. Greg's far more interested in people, I think, than I am. I tend to be a solitary person. I think Greg's more likes to get out and dive into the water, whereas I'm more inclined to just want to watch the water. When it comes to the chemistry, you don't want to uh, unpack it so as it's ruined. Thanks very much for this. Very I'd shake your hand if I could. Have a nice day. We don't socialise all that much. And I think it's as if it's, it's a protective thing that we don't want to sully or somehow disturb whatever the rainbow connection is that makes this thing work. We've never discussed it, but I think that's probably at the back of his mind as it is at the back of mine. Friendship is a very tricky thing because we're colleagues, colleagues who ad lib. So when we get together and be friends, we amuse each other by being Roy and HG. But the trouble is we come to work and we think, oh, we've done all this. We always resisted over the years being interviewed as John or Greg because they are dull fellows. In comparison to, you know, HG and Roy, they are dull fellows. You know, they don't do much. You know, one hardly leaves the house and the other just, you know, has a swim every day and walks the dog. You know, hardly interesting people. They're not. <laughs> Here comes Merv now, as we can see him here. Lonely. Is that a lonely man, I ask you? That is a, that is a lonely bloke who, who deserves, who demands our sympathy and our care. Well, they're not an easy act to describe, are they? Quite impenetrable to begin with. I'll tell you what, Merv, well, I mean, he's asking for support. That's, That's all. Right. He's a cry for help. Of a course it was. Support. They talk about the things the jocks really love, but they do it in a way that the nerds enjoy. How are you there, mate? Not bad. Not bad. Yeah, good. Yeah, battling with it all okay? Hi. Oh, yeah. What's yeah, good. Good. They make fun of the Australian character, they make fun of sport, but they love sport, and they love the Australian character. They're poetic, they're theatrical, they're funny, they can be political. It's everything. The one I got overnight was obviously the Trump and the disinfectant, which was lovely. Yes. And the story about the... Uh... Disinfectant and light. You were seeing two performers who are in love with each other. They just love each other's minds. They delight in each other. And light, yeah. Well, I bought somehow the Somehow get light inside people. Yeah, but that's, you see, that's uh, Pete... I know, that's Evans. where the lamp comes in. Yeah, the lamp. So I bought the notes about the lamp. I drive my partner nuts because I practice HG with the car radio on, and the car radio generates topics and HG responds to it, which drives her nuts. I accept that. I, I don't like the opera house. Don't you? No, I'd start again. Would you? <laughs> the curious thing is, I can never tell a joke. Uh, I don't think I could write a joke. But what I can do is express attitudes. You go into the main concert theatre, you can't hear anything. No, no. <laughs> the acoustics are terrible. It looks stupid, it's all curved and... Uh, oh, no, not the bloody lot down. And build us a nice big Australian fibro box. <laughs> this is just what I do. You know, do you know what I mean? It's, it, if you said, could you teach me to do it, I don't think I could. I was born and grew up in Adelaide, and I always felt an outsider. This was a room that my mum spent a lot of time in. My parents didn't have a great relationship. My mum lost the great love of her life in the Second World War. She wasn't alone in that area. And I think that if my parents had divorced a lot earlier or separated a lot earlier, I think things for the kids would have become a lot easier. 
if you do have an unhappy childhood, you're driven to create a mythical world in which you might be able to have an experience of life which is more enjoyable. If you said to me, would it be possible sitting in this room at the age of 14 or 15 to think that I would do the things? Not a hope in hell. I couldn't work out how to make myself seem more interesting, uh, except lie. Of course, in later life, this proved incredibly useful because this HGE lies about everything anyway. I was born and raised in Lithgow. I sort of slipped between the cracks in a way in the family. My sister, who was just a couple of years younger than me, was profoundly autistic. And this captured a lot of the attention, quite rightly, of mum and dad. The blinds were down, we didn't see many people, and we just got on with, you know, or I did. I just in invented a world that I sort of hid in. I cannot recall wanting for anything, and very rarely was I bored, but I was left to my own devices. I left when I was 17 because it was a, a challenging circumstance to be in, especially when uh, my sister was self-destructive, which she was for a long, long time. The first things I did when I left home were travel overseas. And then I came back to Adelaide, and the only thing I had in mind was I didn't want to be in Adelaide. <laughs> At the Pram Factory in Drummond Street, Carlton, the Australian Performing Group has caused experimental theatre to flourish for the past decade. We've got to make cutbacks. I was able to go from Adelaide to Melbourne and work for the Pram Factory, and out of that, trying to earn a living in the creative arts. Do you take checks? Oh, that's cool. I've got cash. Do you take American money? No, only real money. Should I? Bit of a bummer. You'll have to put them all back. And through all of this came lots of other choices, like working on early on Triple R, the radio station. It's two minutes after 10 on a Wednesday morning, and this is Greg Pickhaver. Thanks I quickly realised that uh, popular culture had many prongs, and one of the prongs is sport. So I jumped over to begin talking about sport in between the records that I was playing. First quarter of the 1980 grand final between Collingwood and Richmond. Then this morphed into this weird thing where three or four of us got together and called the AFL Grand Finals starting about 1980. We had the elements of Roy and HG together, but not with John and Greg. John's career before starting on This Sporting Life was working as a high school teacher in the Newcastle area. My first year of teaching was absolutely appalling. Second year of teaching, I learned how to teach and I had five terrific years. I, I loved it. And then after the uh, sixth year, I, I thought, mm -hmm. and I was getting itchy feet. I wanted to do something else. So I got interested in the theatre. Then the work ran out in Newcastle and I moved to Sydney and got a few plays with the Sydney Theatre Company and it was the life of a jobbing actor. I came to live in Sydney for a while, not knowing how it would work, and first met John working on a program for SBS called Five Times Dizzy. Did you win? Thank you. Nearly did. Five Times Dizzy was a show largely for kids. Oh. I played one of the dads in the area, and John played a mad sort of professor from near, a house nearby. The professor was always around and doing something, but it was better if you didn't ask what. I met Greg on the set on day one of filming. For some reason or other, we just happened to end up in the caravan together. He was reading the back pages of the newspaper and assembling material. He was looking for material. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so much to read. To engage in the pop culture of Sydney, which he's always interested in, he had to know a little bit more about rugby league and I was very happy to fill him in. All these ideas were swirling around in my head at the time that I met John. I had these few elements of a partially built show. But what I needed was somebody to play the role of the retired sporting commentator. And when I met John, within 30 seconds, I realised, oh, he'd be really good at this. He must have said, 
come along and we'll just suck it and see, I guess. I'm not sure that I could actually recall exactly when I decided that if I had to be somebody, it would be H.G. Nelson. But I always liked the idea of the wrestling hold, the half Nelson, as being a source of something. The Slavens were a big sporting family in Lithgow and uh, I always was attracted to the name Roy because it means king, so it, it comes with some gravitas. Uh, Greg attached the, put the rampaging on it the, the first time he introduced me on air and uh, I didn't mind that, that was fine. Sydney's contemporary music radio station, JJJ. By the time Triple J arrives, I've largely got the idea that HG and Roy are going to make a program which parodies a commercial sports program. Triple J had a pretty broad brief. They didn't have any interest in sport, and so we decided that we'd try and provide a review of the week. I think he did a, a, a fearless editorial about something and then invited me to do an editorial as well as Roy Slaven. I don't think we actually spoke to each other until we did the grand final. Lang Mac coming on with the electrical tape there. Did you used to wear electrical tape, Roy, around No, mate, no, no, electrical tape came in after my time. And that's when he started feeding me the questions in the hours build up before the game kicks off. And that's when we realised that, you know, there was stuff to mine here. Mick Cronin dead in front, Roy, would you say? Dead in front. I think the, the Crow should eat this one up. Although it's an interesting trend in the last few weeks, I've noticed with the Crow that when he does kick the ball, it sort of swerves towards Gerringong. And I think it might be trying to tell him something, that it's time to, you know, pack that weary bag and take those legs, those tight old legs, back home. So, based on the success of that 86 grand final, they then offered us a four-hour Saturday afternoon gig. It was great. It, it was joyous. I was shocked that they allowed us to do it in the first place and I thought after a week, they'll, a couple of weeks, they'd say, oh, no, we don't want that anymore and they move on. Yeah. But when at the end of the first year they said, oh, would you come back next year, we were still in a nervous, vaguely nervous arrangement with them, thinking, well, would they have us back? Pull them up, pull them on and pat down for bludging on the blind side. <laughs> with the master of midfield mayhem, rampaging Roy Slaven, and the leading light of long shots, H.G. Nilsson. Let her rip, H.G. What a week, what an incredible week, a week when too much sport is barely enough, and like many of you, I'm really enjoying this. Well, I'm loving it, in fact, this less is more approach to sport. In 35 years of doing Roy and H.G., the formula's hardly changed, and why should it? Rugby union is the most corporatised... Well, they're the Qantas Wallabies, for God's sake. Mm. The ground rules are um, very simple. We be as long-winded as possible. We make the serious trivial and the trivial serious. We never disagree with each other and HG always asks the questions. They're the rules. Elegant and simple. <laughs> I know you're the biosecurity expert for the NRL and, you know, obviously a secret. You're in Mufti, so to speak. I'm not allowed to talk about it. No. Yeah. yeah. But can I ask, just for a start, yep. <clears throat> will, um, you know, household products be part of the regime? A lot of radio comedy duos are combative. They, you know, bang up against each other. But Roy and HG use a thing in improvisation called Yes and so they always accept the other's premise. I, I've had no news of that what's Nor going me. on there today. Nor me, very quiet. They are both just running in the same direction with a fearlessness that says, we have no idea where this may end up, but we are going to go there together. What I love about watching Roy and HG work is that not only are they always supportive of each other, but they genuinely listen to one another. Do you know how rare that is? I don't want to say too much, no. but there would be testing every couple of hours. Once you've given but... them a big hit of Dead Oh? Oh, yeah, Dettol yeah. will be about, for sure. For sure, sure, sure. Pine and Clean, as you say, and there are a few other products we're looking Harvey. at as well. Oh, I hadn't thought of Hart. I'll put no. that on the list. Thank you very much, HG. Good recommendation. He's building a safety net for me. I'm building a safety net for him. It's a very easy way to work. And, and once you establish that as a, as a modus operandi, you can go for 35 years. <laughs> now, what you need in rugby league administration, as far as I'm concerned, you need to understand rugby league nuance. It's a great ambition to make Greg laugh. Man, that doesn't get better. Uh, and I'm sure he feels the same. But uh, 
part of us is always just a little bit disappointed that we've let the guard slip. You cannot allow the audience to know where your sympathy lies with any of this in terms of the humour. People turn it on and say, we just heard two blokes talking about sport and turned it off. And I think, whew, it still works. Back it comes to AB. AB gets it away to Deborah Carr. Deborah Carr gets it onto the toe. Look, oh gee, wouldn't the king love to be out there now? It was the late 80s, I was at Sydney Uni and we went to a friend's house to watch a grand final of something. And then all of a sudden they turned the sound down on the television and they turn Triple J up and there's these two guys doing something hilarious. Mate against mate, state against state, date against date. It was fantastic having them simulcast their Royal Nation 2 with the Origin Games. There's a blue one, a blue on the background. It was such a serious thing, State of Origin. It's very intense. But of course, <laughs> when you listen to Royal HG and they've got all those wonderful uh, and colourful nicknames for the players. Brick with eyes goes by himself. It's a sky, it's a try. The brick with eyes. It's just very uh, refreshing. Players don't get to choose their nicknames. No, they don't. And that's, that's where we come in. Yeah. So Roy and HG used to call me the buttocks. I was pretty ha happy with the buttocks, actually. There were a couple of guys who weren't particularly happy with nicknames they were uh, laboured with. <laughs> the Enigma gets back up to his feet, plays it to the captain, back door, Benny Elias, Benny onto the brick. The brick goes... And they're often cruel. Yeah, they're cruel. Uh, you know. Dishhead Dowling. Now, Dishhead hated being called Dishhead Dowling. He did. Backdoor Benny Elias. Mm. Um, the door. The door. They call him the door, but we, he's backdoor Benny. Back door. I mean, I don't back know door. why they... You know, short. Short. I mean, it loses punch, loses impact. Yes. But I don't think he liked it very much. Uh, they fell yes. into two groups, those yeah. that were happy, those that weren't. <laughs> and when they become old enough to understand State of Origin... Uh... Roy and HG called me the brick with eyes. And I have the memento to prove it. Uh, this was on... Uh, they presented this to me on the uh, Sporting Life and uh, it's very, very cherished in the uh, Lazarus household. <laughs> no, no, no. Say good evening to rampaging Roy Slaven and H.D. Nelson. What I think is incredible about Roy and HD is that they took what was so successful from radio to television. Our first experiment with doing it on television was just radio with pictures, really, and it wasn't terribly interesting. By G. Roy, what a weekend coming up. The International Festival of the Boot. Out of that came other suggestions. We made a bit of a burst on This Sporting Life, which was a sort of punk sort of television. Yes, hello, everyone, and welcome to another This Sporting Life. And thanks, Asia, for joining us on an evening when too much sport will be barely enough. Later in the it was an idea which was very limited, very low-rent television, lo-fi television. <laughs> Then we decided to invent a club, put a, do a club variety show. It's time to rumba, it's time to samba, it's time to rattle, to dazzle, it's time to club buggery! Club buggery dropped out of the air into my mind. I just thought, that's perfect. That's perfect. You know, we talk to guests and we wear bow ties and drink martinis and stuff like that. Very civilised, very proper. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Club Buggery, coming to you from the back door of Benny Elias this evening. The variety show format is absolutely ripe to be sent up, correct? If you are going to find any two people who are going to, you know, turn any trope on its head, it'll be those two. All of a sudden we had this television program, this solid television program, which ran for about 120 eps. And here live, Saturday Night Live. Mike Myers came on the show, only because he wanted to be able to go back home and say, I've been on Club Buggery. Uh, but he was very, very good about it. He, uh, he edited the spirit of the show. He was, he was lovely. People love seeing a bit of red on the ice. Well, um... <laughs> I know I did bloody well do. You're getting a little excited. Yeah, I see. <laughs> it's turning me on. And we remember the awful night when Paul emerged with a bloody night. Bob Hawke was terrific. Sting refused to come on the show because Sting's management didn't feel it would suit his image to be on a show called that had anything to do with buggery. 
Zelfs graag een taal fellow. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy! Well, the dream was another bit of luck. Channel 7 rang up and said, how'd you like to come and make a show about the Olympics for us? I don't think they knew what they were getting, and we didn't really know what they wanted. All those years of practice all of a sudden pays off. We're making over two hours of live television every night the games are on. At a time when you, Australia could easily have overdosed on Olympic content, they took a dead slot on TV and made it the essential viewing of the Olympics. Corkscrew, double corkscrew, and then a batter the serve. Batter the serve. <laughs> a bit of a there, and a crazy date. It's the first crazy date we've seen with total with elevation. Launch. 360 degree crazy date, and Steve, look at that. Often a gymnastics term in competition is named after the person who first introduces that trick. And we thought, well, hang on a minute, if they're made up in that way, why don't we make up all the terms? Into the corner. A Ooh, bit of a goose. Bit of a goose. Have a one of those. <laughs> Crazy day, oh, spinning, spinning day. Back Ooh, into a batter serve. serve. And, and another hello, boys. Ooh, a fully flung, flung, hello. flat bag hello, <laughs> boys. <laughs> and I'm home into the corner with a lammy leap. So us calling the gymnastics got more and more elaborate as it went along. A little guy <laughs> that people have taken to their hearts. Actually, and it's not only people in Australia. Fatso, the big assed wombat, talks to people of the whole world. Yeah. The it's whole true. world it's see true. him as a, as a mascot that does celebrate humanity. Mm. The Australian Olympic Committee had dug its heels in and told the Olympian not to be not to be seen with this mascot because it's not in our commercial interest. One of the producers took the fatso, the stunt fatso, down to the victory dais, and I think Michael Klim held it for us. And then all of a sudden we had a story about Fatso's Day. And then, of course, Fatso became the battler's prince. There has been a mascot that some of the Australian swimmers have been carrying in called Fatso the Wombat, and there is a suggestion that perhaps the IOC has made some ruling to uh, ban Fatso. I'm not aware of banning Fatso. Given that there are official games mascots, um, is Fatso stealing the show? And does Sokog have any concern about that? No, they don't. We don't. So the whole fatso business took on a life of its own and it was very, very satisfying, I would say. My favourite piece on the dream was when, <laughs> was when they commentated on the synchronised swimming. And we start in depression times when there was nothing but bleakness. And they said it was a metaphor for the building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It is... it's a work of genius. That's right. We should see the drilling uh, of the foundations <laughs> very soon, I think, actually. Here they there go. Are, drilling. There's the drilling of the first foundation on the north side and, and the south side, side, both at the same time. So it's all those things that we thought about beforehand that could work, worked. We hardly had a dud. Oh, it was a hit. We, we, we had a hit. You know, it was the first time we'd had a hit. Say farewell. Here it is. Farewell. From the dream. But it was impossible to keep the momentum going. Put a gap in we battled away with various television projects. Obviously, they fell in the shadow of the dream a lot. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't really succeed. While we were doing all these other things on the television and so on, we're still making the program, the radio program, on Triple J. Look, it, it, it was just getting a little bit silly. Here we were on the youth network, you know. I look at this grey-haired fellow shaving of a morning, I think, well, I'm going into the youth network. Let's go, kids. So uh, then it was decided that probably after 22 years it was best to take the caravan elsewhere. And then um, out of the blue came an offer from Triple M, um, which was, yeah, a new challenge and a lot of fun. I don't know where the offer came from for us to return to the ABC this year. Greg just gave me a call and said, oh, look, I was talking to such and such. And so the offer came. It feels like uh, returning to a very comfortable pair of shoes and you wonder why you stopped wearing them. Just before the lockdown started, which, which you, you may remember we got two rounds of rugby league away, 
around about the start of the rugby league season, we were able to begin the show we're doing now. It's the perfect landscape for us because we're not encumbered by fact. In fact, the less that's happening, the more it gives you the license to talk about whatever you want. When there's no sport on, there's more to talk about in sport. And of course, the cracks in sport, which have been there for some time, are exacerbated by the virus. I mean, it just brings change everywhere. All right, Johnny can do it. Look, Johnny, you've come in at the 77th minute of Penrith v North yeah. Sydney, 2018. I'm not HG. I'm HG when the red light goes on, and I'm not all the rest of the time. Yeah. Now, John is not Roy in the same way. Well, this is Captain Tom walking around his backyard. Yeah, that's right. There's got to be a clear delineation between a character you're doing and yourself. There's got to be. Any character you do is essentially a mask. You put a mask on. And if you don't have that, you're seriously exposed very quickly. But it's been what I'd consider a much better week for believers, HG, a much better week. There are green shoots of optimism in a deeply troubled landscape. That's what I'm seeing. One of the saddest days of my life was when my sister died uh, four or five weeks ago. It, it was a, a, a blow to me that was worse than when mum and dad left. I, 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 serious grief, serious, serious, serious grief. But I had uh, to do a show the following Saturday. Now, the only way you can do a show under those circumstances is if you've got a mask to wear. Very few acts of any kind last that long. And very few acts like that can still be working and still feel relevant. This is an act which needs some practice, some maintenance, in the same way as a guitarist in their late 60s, 70s might have to practice a little bit. But we see ourselves exactly as that. Mm. And why would we stop? I think they still get each other. I think they still love doing it together. They don't need props. They don't need a set. They literally just need each other. Greg is the driver. He, he sits in the driver's seat, and I've always been the passenger, and happy to be so. My understanding is, is it's up to me to make the decisions. If I went to him and said, look, I don't think we can do it anymore, he'd accept it. If I can make him laugh, that's a point to me. If he makes me laugh, it's a point to him. Yeah. So we're still engaged by that process. We're still engaged by that process. And probably, well, I don't know who's ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> You would know within 30 seconds if I didn't enjoy it. You would know within a nanosecond that the time was up. I oh, know I'm looking forward to this week's show as much as I've looked forward to anything. <laughs> They're probably Australian icons, really, you know. I mean, they've, they've lasted the 30 years plus in a pretty tough industry. So I think uh, long may they uh, continue. <laughs> I've been the luckiest person on the planet. And lucky the day that I stepped into that caravan and met Greg because it would have been a totally different landscape had I not. I still find it as amusing now as I did 35 years ago. It still is. I don't know why, but it is. We haven't got to the point yet, which was the dream, that somebody would pay us to shut up. <laughs>